Coming up, we are talking about indigenous economics. Plus, artist Jean Lamar is the subject of a major retrospective in Nevada. And it's still a house divided as both parties look to get legislation passed as the midterms approach. I am Alia Chavez. Join us for those interviews plus headlines from the ICT newscast. The Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University is honored to be a supporter of Indian Country Today. Working with award-winning professors, Cronkite students learn news reporting, social media, shooting and editing videos, and producing content for communications industries. Cronkite's 15 professional programs give students the opportunity to cover critical issues throughout the U.S. and beyond. Learn more at cronkite.asu.edu. This is the ICT Newscast with Alia Chavez. Thank you for joining the ICT Newscast. The White House has released the hotline for Americans to order free COVID-19 tests. To order your test, you can call 1-800-232-0233. That number again is 1-800-232-0233. The federal government is providing four tests to every residential address and residential P.O. box in the United States. On Tuesday, the acting director of the Indian Health Service, Elizabeth Fowler, urged Native people to order their tests, which are free of charge. News of the hotline comes a week after the, the White House opened an online portal to get tests, which can be seen at covidtests.gov. Tribal nations in Northern California are celebrating a land back victory. On Tuesday, a group called Save the Redwoods transferred more than 500 acres of redwood forest to tribes. The 10 tribes in the Intertribal Sinkian Wilderness Council will now be the caretakers of the place they traditionally call Fish Run Place. Priscilla Hunter is the chairwoman of the council and a citizen of the Coyote Valley Band of Pomo Indians. She said in a statement, it's a real blessing. It's like healing for our ancestors. I know our ancestors are happy. This was given to us to protect. Save the Redwoods League made the purchase and will transfer ownership to the council. According to the former owners, the property was last logged 30 years ago and still has a large number of old-growth redwoods. In Montana, one tribal nation will soon open the doors of a much-needed health clinic. The Little Shell Tribal Health Clinic is located in Great Falls, Montana. It will provide medical, dental, behavioral, and traditional support for its citizens. Molly Wedland is the health director of the clinic. She says the tribal nation was determined to get this done. The Little Shell Tribe, the council just does not give up and they wanna do what's best for the members. Um, so after federal recognition, a couple of the um, council members met with IHS about uh, getting a clinic for the tribe. And I just kind of um, showed an algorithm and what was available for funding and, and said, you know, it'll be about 40 years before we're able to, to get you a facility. Um, and the council said, um, we, we can't do that. And um, so then we used our uh, COVID-19 funding to remodel a clinic. Administrators say the clinic's goal will be to help tribal citizens live healthier and longer lives. The clinic was scheduled to open at the end of this month, but due to COVID-19 impacts, the tribe says it will have to wait a little longer. The United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization is recognizing Kenya's traditional pre-colonial cuisine. The East African nation spent the last 15 years promoting traditional healthy foods. This cultural heritage almost vanished in colonial times, but farmers worked to improve nutrition knowledge, and now that's paying off. Research shows that there are about 220 species of traditional vegetables now being eaten by 60 or so communities in the country. One mixed vegetable farmer remembers when farming practices were different. In the olden days, we never spray traditional vegetables with pesticides as they would grow naturally without it. We would only add a little fertilizer. We also depend on rainfall for water. That is the advantage 
of traditional vegetables. The country has also been selected for listing in the Register of Good Safeguarding Practices. According to UNESCO, the listing aims to protect history, languages, and values. Well, news for you hoop dancers. The Herd Museum is rescheduling its World Championship Hoop Dance Contest. The museum's Indian Fair and Market is still scheduled for March 5th and 6th, but the championships will take place later in the month. This dance honors cultural tradition shared by many indigenous communities. With roots in healing, today's hoop dance is shared as an art, celebrating indigenous traditions throughout the U.S. and Canada. Men and women compete on an equal field, and individual routines may feature as few as four to as many as 50 hoops. Dancers are judged on five skills, precision, timing, rhythm, showmanship, creativity, and speed. The top Indigenous American and Canadian First Nations hoop dancers will be competing for the title and cash prizes on March 26th and 27th. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast. Coming up, we take a deep dive into the art of Jean Lamar and Native Economics with Mark Trahant, plus Partisanship with John Tasuda. ICT's Editor-at-Large is examining Indigenous economics with a focus on climate change and ESG. Welcome, Mark. Tell us, what is ESG? So um, it's hard to determine whether ESG or Indigenous economics or some of the other concepts I talk up to is what's going to get people the most bored. It's words that come up that, wow, you look at them and you almost have to stand back. But when you start to pull them apart, they're fascinating. And ESG is one of those. So ESG stands for Environment, Social, and Governance. And it's a standard for corporations on how they get to sustainability. One of the interesting things about that is the whole thing has a tie to Indian country. When in the 1980s, the Lakota Fund was doing microloans, uh, long before others in the world were being recognized for that, uh, a major mutual fund called Calvert um, looked at the Lakota Fund and actually uh, reached out to Rebecca Adamson, who was involved, and put her on the board. And the Calvert Fund became one of the big companies doing ESG investing, where they used environment, social, and governance as a screen before investors would put money into a company. Well, that continued on for about um, 40 years. And what's really changed is one, it's become a global standard. The United Nations now uses a variation of ESG in how it measures companies. And uh, beginning this year and soon, the Securities and Exchange Commission will take ESG standards and apply them to the regulatory structure. So if a company says it does ESG and it doesn't, there could be consequences. And those regulations come out in March. What's really critical about all this is this is how we get to net zero carbon emissions is to use the private sector and to use how companies manage themselves in order to reduce carbon emissions. What are some of the tangible ways that ESG is measured in these companies? Well, and that's a really interesting question itself because what are the accounting standards used for ESG? So a piece I have today on climate accountability looks at Bank of America and Enbridge and we all know about Enbridge with Line 3 and some of the other projects it's involved with, but ES, uh, Enbridge says it's an ESG company. And so when you start to pull apart, what does that mean? Are they meeting environmental standards? If so, why are they building new facilities now? What is driving them? And then also governance is a big part of it. Do they have native members on their board of directors? Do they have native sign off on some of these projects? And clearly the answer is no. So the company is saying things about ESG that just don't add up. And so that's the whole point of the stories is to get some sense of accountability as a company says it. So how does ESG actually apply to indigenous communities? 
Well, you think about whether Standing Rock or Line 3 or now uh, the Terminal Enbridge's building in Texas, uh, Rio Tinto, you can go down the list of all of the conflicts involving natural resources in Indian country. And ESG could be a standard that instead of just standing there and saying, don't build this, you could go to the company and say, here are the rules. Are you meeting these tests? Is this is how you're going to govern the project? and to get more accountability for how a company actually operates rather than just philosophical. And I guess in some ways it could actually align with the core values of indigenous communities, which are which are these ideas of taking care of the environment, but also making sure that you're being inclusive in the projects that you're doing. Oh, absolutely. And I think I think there's very much indigenous values in ESG and other sustainability projects. I mean, Really, the test is this, is we as a planet have to figure out how to reduce our carbon emissions in a really dramatic way. A report I cited today from McKinsey says we're just not getting there. And tools like ESG are essential if we're ever going to get down to that where we make real change. In your reporting, are you finding anything? I mean, you already mentioned one with Enbridge, but are you finding any other examples that are just surprising you? One that I haven't written about yet is Rio Tinto. We know about some of the real uh, uh, problems with Rio Tinto in Arizona with San Carlos Apache and some of the other Apache people. And yet the company proclaims itself as an ESG. And I, I intend to actually go through the all of their public filings and the tribe statements and bring them together in a way that shows they're not doing what they say they're doing. On a journalistic standpoint, I'm wondering if you can sort of characterize for us how important this reporting on ESG is. Has this been done before your reporting on this? And if not, you know, give us a better uh, understanding of why it's so important to report on this. Yeah, it's really not been uh, reported before, and particularly in this focus with Indigenous communities. And I think what's been missing is it gives Indigenous communities a tool to uh, hold companies to higher standards. And that's the really journalistic purpose. Well, Mark, what's coming up next in this Indigenous Economics Project of yours? One cool project is I'm developing a database of Native Americans serving on corporate boards of directors. And uh, you think about a board of directors as being way off somewhere, but the average salary for a board member is now $300,000 a year. And so far, the number of Natives serving on boards is less than one-tenth of 1%. And that's actually something that you love to take a deep dive in. I know that you like to look at the Native representation in things like Congress and things like, uh, you know, federal judges and now in corporate boards. Exactly. I'm looking forward to um, actually following through and seeing what the numbers look like. (laughs) Well, we'll look forward to it. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. When we come back, a look at the art of Jean Lamar. Earlier this month, the Nevada Museum of Art opened a new exhibit exploring the career of Northern Paiute and Pitt River artist Jean Lamar. Lamar has worked as a printmaker, painter, and producer. Her work has focused heavily on addressing cultural stereotypes, women, and her ancestors. All of this is shown in the museum's 100 paintings, prints, and sculptures from Lamar. The retrospective also showcases a 220-page book, a symposium, and a short film. Let's take a look at the trailer. I was influenced by the beauty of the mountains and the skies and all the natural things that are going on here. Well, what I like to do is get down into their spiritual soul. Well, what is the heart of the matter? What is, what is their needs? What do they want? And put it out there aesthetically. And then they can learn how to grow with that. They can grow. 
I use my artwork in a beautiful way so that I can bring people into their artwork, but yet I have a message for them. And that message has to do with how I feel our Indian people are being treated. There was a stereotype that we're vanished Americans. We're gone. There's no more. Joining us today is Senevi Spoon Hunter, who created that film called Purple Flower Girl. Senevi, thanks for being here. Hello, Leah. Thank you for having me. So tell us about Jean Lamar. So Jean Lamar, as you mentioned, is a northern um, Paiute and Pitt River artist out of a small town in Susanville, California. I had the pleasure of filming with her in 2020, after I had finished my graduate program and um, the Nevada Museum of Art commissioned me to make this work. So I understand that you spent a lot of time with her and I'd be very curious to learn about the parts of her that you really wanted to capture in this short film. So the short film really does chronicle her life up from her rural upbringing in, in Susanville up into her current position um, as an artist. Uh, she continues her art from her home in Susanville on the reservation there. It's actually called a rancheria in that area. But anyway, so we've, I filmed with her and something that I really liked about her is just the parallels that we had in our lives. We're both Northern Paiute women who grew up in rural California. And, you know, she also went to the University of California, Berkeley. And when I was studying there, I would always walk by this park. It's called the Ohlone Park. And there in, in the middle of the park is a mural that she did. And I had no idea at the time that she had completed this mural and it's titled The Ohlone Journey. And so, you know, being in that space, walking by that, it really made me, it comforted me. And just knowing that she's the one behind the work really, uh, you know, made me feel honored to capture the story. A retrospective in a museum is such a big deal. It really highlights the career of an artist. And I've heard so many times that for an artist to get a retrospective is just something completely spectacular. What was her reaction to um, having that honor? Yeah, I think for a lot of people in Nevada who are familiar with her work and artists in, in the region, they, they, they think it was a long time coming for her. I mean, she has a huge impact in the Native American region in that area, but also, you know, in the larger art world with her printmaking and her focus on challenging colonial constructs and just, you know, her passion behind the work that she does. And so I think, it, like I said, has been a long time coming and it's going to be a great celebration for her. Uh, so much of her artwork has focused on activism, and I know that there have been a number of Native activists to come from the University of California, Berkeley. How do you think that that really influenced the kind of art that she made? Yeah, so in the film, she has a quote that I really, it really resonated strongly with me. And in that quote, she says, question authority, don't take things as is. And that's something that she attributes to her studies at UC Berkeley. And, and I think that she really does that. She questions authority. She goes in and creates these beautiful pieces of artwork that often have purple in them. Um, just a side note here that Purple Flower Girl is her Indian name. And so you can see that color spread across all of her works and her pieces of art. And so just to have that, like drawing the viewer in with these beautiful colors, but then also has like a very strong message for the viewer and really, you know, prompts these questions about, like we've been talking about colonialism and things like that. I'd love to learn more about the production of this short film. You mentioned earlier that you filmed this in 2020, but in total, you know, how much time did you spend with her and what was the behind the scenes process like? So it was a two person crew. It was myself as acting as producer director and then my partner, a cinematographer and editor. Um, and what we did was we went in and it was really just a couple of days with her filming with her at her home on the Rancheria in Susanville. And she drove us around and welcomed us into her home, which you'll see in the film is also dotted, it's just purple everywhere. And she just really like loves the color. And so um, it was a really fun experience to be able to sit with her. She showed us some photos of her when she was growing up, but talked about what her life was like. Um, and so that was really so 
moving forward, we did the edit process and that was that lasted a few weeks and we wrapped up with just in a couple of months. And for the folks at home who are listening to this interview and want to watch this short film, how can they do that? So there'll be a link if you go to Nevada Museum of Art and go on to her exhibition details, there'll be a link provided for an online um, kind of virtual tour of this exhibition. Well, Sunevi Spoonhunter, thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Pichetto. And we'll be right back. What's the verdict? The Biden administration is a year old, but his leadership is challenged on every front with approval ratings at a record low. John Tasuda gives us his report card for this new Democratic administration. He's a regular contributor to the ICT newscast and longtime Beltway insider. Today, he is a partner with Navigators Global, which provides political services to several industries, including tribes. Hi, John. Hi, Elliot. Great to be with you again. On a pass curve fail, how would you rate President Biden's year in office? Uh, Probably a a B plus, um, I would say. I think uh, they they tried to, and I'm speaking strictly from sort of the tribal perspective, um, from the broader perspective, I'd probably give them a little lower than that. Um, So, uh, and unfortunately for us, I think the broader uh, issues have kind of dragged down uh, what what could have been you know a really fast fast moving and, and uh, positive tribal uh, agenda, uh, but it's kind of gotten caught up with the other uh, all the other projects. So, in particular, um, things that they want to fund, you know, new billing, uh, new projects they want to get going because there's been no new appropriations yet. You know, we can't get started on that. In terms of the things that, let's actually start with the bad. In terms of the things that, you know, could use improvement, what are those areas for you? Well, I think that uh, there's always a a bit of a challenge for a new administration coming in when dealing with Indian country. Uh, So typically a new administration comes in, they want to strike quick, right? They want to make a market departure from the prior administration. They have, you know, a new agenda. They have, you know, new policies that they campaigned on, and they really want to put those into place quickly. Uh, but as we all know, in Indian country, we don't like to move very fast. We like people to talk about it and explain to us what, what things are going to do, that they're going to do, how they're going to work, what the potential impacts, and give the, you know tribal leaders a chance to respond to those before things are put in place. So that, that, that doesn't work quite as well in Indian country. And so um, they did strike out on a few things um, early, and uh, they're already getting some pushback. You know, some of the some of the agenda items they have are kind of conflicting with tribal priorities, uh, with energy development, and uh, you look at places like Alaska, uh, in which the you know the the regional corporations uh, that fund a lot of uh, native programs in, in, in the state, um, you know the the administration came in and, and said they're going to curtail energy development. Well, that's a big piece of the economic development that they have there, so they're getting pushback on that. Um, so, you know, again, you know, one of those things that it's kind of a challenge if you want to come in and move quickly uh, to try to get uh, the discussion going and, and then put it in place. And then again, as I you know, alluded to you know, at the start, you know, not being able to have uh, new appropriations in place, still running off of an old budget, um, that really kind of hampers your ability to move quickly as well. And what are some of the things that you think the Biden administration has done well? Well, they certainly have done a great job uh, at reaching out and trying to start the consultation process uh, with tribes uh, as a new administration. Um, they did um, what they called a, a, you know, a White House policy conference, although it was all virtual, which makes it a little more challenging to have the kind of real give and take that tribal leaders like. Um, but, but, you know, I thought that at least they made the attempt and that that was, that was a good sign, uh, good faith on their part. So I think they get deserve kudos for that. Um, again, I think that, uh, you know, it's been a challenge for them to kind of get launched on major policy issues. 
Um, and you know, they began uh, or they have begun a series of consultations to look at their consultation policy. And um, you know, that doesn't uh, that's not very substantive. And so uh, I think that that's uh, you know certainly something that can always be improved on, but wouldn't have been my choice for sort of the first major thing to to consult on. In terms of what's next and moving forward, what kinds of policy agendas would you like to see pushed forward? Well, I think that uh, really a tribal first uh, policy, you know, and in particular with decision making. And so there were some uh, really positive steps made uh, in the Trump administration to take things like environmental decisions and really put tribal decision and decision making at the forefront of that. And uh, so, you know, that's something that tribes have asked for for years. And if you do that, that really puts the tribes in a position where they can uh, make uh, the kind of uh, calls that they want. And so if they want to have energy development, they could push that forward. If they don't want to have that and they really want to be focused on environmental factors, et cetera, then they can make that their choice. But it's, it's really their decision to make. And so I think that would be, you know, a really great step for them to, to pick up and keep moving the ball forward on that. John, thank you so much. Thank you. And that's a slice of our Indigenous world. Thank you for watching. For all the latest news, visit IndianCountryToday.com. I am Aaliyah Chavez. Sometimes you got to take a stand Just because you know you can oh, You got to run, you got to run, you got to run.